Emily. And I'm Paulus. And this is Up Your Arts. The podcast which explores how the arts can enrich your life. Yay! <laughs> how are you doing, my darling? Well, you and I and Keith, of course, on the decks are in lockdown. Well, I, I keep saying that. People were talking about it being locked down on the, the news this morning on television, actually, uh, in an official way, which surprised me because we had a conversation, didn't we, in our last Apocalypse Wow uh, Skype version of this uh, of this not being a lockdown. But apparently it's been adopted. It has been adopted as a lockdown now. But I feel like... I don't, not really sure. I missed a memo there, uh, but I'm fine. I'm fine. We're moving the chest of drawers and dusting six years of dust away. We are flipping the mattress and these things are not metaphors. We are literally doing them, uh, my <laughs> husband and I. And uh, yeah, we're fine. I'm uh, doing well in Southeast London and trying to not beat myself up too much about not being terribly creative right now. That's where I'm at with my creativity and this very strange time we find ourselves in. Where are you, Emily? Um, I'm all right. Yeah, I, uh, I kind of, I've got some shimmy classes that I'm starting tomorrow morning. And um, so, yeah, by your, um, yes, by your desk. So it's like for the people who are still for people who are still working from home um, that, you know, you don't have your morning commute. So how do you get your frustration out in the morning before you sit down at your desk? You shimmy it out. That's my thought. Uh, so, yeah, that might have collapsed by the time this um, podcast has gone out. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> the the desk desk sweeping the nation. Collapsed. <laughs> So uh, we're uh, we're also on Skype and we'll be showing this on uh, video so many people will be able to already see our special guests <laughs> shimmying in her own home in Clapham, um, somewhere near Clapham, I won't say where. Uh, it is uh, my very good friend and a uh, long time uh, creative practitioner pal, Miss Sarah Louise Young. Round of virtual applause. Yeah. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Welcome, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. How are you doing? How is um, lockdown treating you? <laughs> I, I feel very lucky. I think like everyone, we've been going through these weird phases where something is obsessively important for two days and then it passes into the next phase. And that's the same for how we're viewing the outside world. You know, one minute we're concerned about social distancing and the next minute we're more concerned about the NHS staff. And I think you kind of go through obsessive circles, you know, so it was toilet roll and then it was hand sanitizer and now it's flour. Um, but I feel very, I feel very grateful that I'm a creative person because I think we're naturally quite used to managing our time, and my partner is a writer as well, so we're quite used to being home. But I'm, I just before doing this call watched Paulus's last um, vlog, and I've been having very similar feelings that there's this sort of strange pressure that you put on yourself to be creative and to come out with a product. And actually, I was very struck by what Nicola Sturgeon said about, you know, life shouldn't feel normal. And, the, you know, if your life is feeling normal, then you're not doing enough. And that actually, <laughs> you've been given this weird situation and it would be strange to try and live the life you were living outside, but just online. So I'm, I'm also running into a lot of questions. And like today is a beautiful sunny day. I have spent the morning cleaning cat poo out of the garden. Nice. And that's, that's given me a huge sense of achievement and I didn't have to put on makeup. <laughs> So I feel I'm, I'm actually weird if it's it, it seems almost guilty to say that I'm enjoying it, but I am enjoying it. Stress about money aside, I think the fact that, you know, obviously I've had nearly a year's work cancelled and thousands of pounds have lost. But you have to get to a point of acceptance. And it's that thing about spheres of influence. You know, what can I control? What can I have influence over? At the moment, I cannot control the date that I go back to work. So there's just no point being stressed about it. And that doesn't mean that some days, I mean, yesterday we hit the gin and tonic at 5.30. That's OK. Um, some days I'm doing, you know, my equivalent of shake size. Um, so I don't know. I think there's a, there's a real invitation to go back inside, question what you actually want, what you want to take with you. Um, and every day is, is, a, is a fresh opportunity to do that. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Paulus. I'm, I'm, I have, there's no fibre of my being that wants to put on makeup and perform in my living room. <laughs> I'm not missing. I'm not missing performing. I'm not missing performing. There, I've said I, it. You said it. <gasps> Does that feel better? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to. I'm going to exclusively reveal for uh, anybody that has been living under a rock for the last uh, five episodes, because this will probably be the sixth one that airs, unless the world changes very dramatically. Uh, that um, 
between Emily and I, I'm probably a little more verbose than she. And, <laughs> uh, and we're, we're, we're learning about podcasting and, and each other. And uh, I'm learning a lot about listening and sharing from doing this. And today is a wonderful uh, opportunity for me to do less because Sarah Louise and I have known each other for a very long time on many platforms, friendship <laughs> stage, uh, rehearsal. Crew station. Room. <laughs> yeah. Dolphew, I think I feel like Dolphew. Um, so I'm going to do my very best uh, to um, let Emily uh, and Sarah Louise have a chat and aid if needed. But I may just sit here and smile. <laughs> and with and with that, I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> right, well, talking about um, you guys working together. Um, so uh, looking for my friend. That's something that you are working on together. Um, and um, so you're directing Paulus at the moment, aren't you, Sarah? He's not directable. I mean, <laughs> that no, was one of the questions. Is, how do you how do you direct that? <laughs> there's um, I mean, there's there's an interesting. This word dramaturg has come about a lot, and I mean, I, I believe the original origin of that word was actually someone who would be. Um, a theatre historian expert. So if you were doing a Jacobean production and someone said, hold on a minute, did they have pockets in that era? You'd go, hold on a minute, I shall consult the dramaturg. And I think there are <laughs> other definitions. So I, I've sort of taken that word to be a facilitator of other people's creative vision. Mm. And my job is to try and help someone create the show they want to make. But because I am a maker, I've realised that I'm only interested in working on projects where my voice can be heard and is wanted. Um, and I, I know that Paulus and I are both uh, uh, recovering control freaks, <laughs> <laughs> control freak in remission. But um, there is a dance in the making room of push and pull and suggestion and invitation. And and I'm not somebody that walk, as a director, I'm not someone that walks around with a version of the cherry tree in their head that they're just desperate to put on. So I yeah. suppose I feel like there are directors who really have a huge artistic vision for a show. And I'm very interested in specifically solo shows, but in enabling someone to put the nuts and bolts together to make a show. And what's been really lovely about this process is because I've been making my own show along the same time, I've had a, an amazing director facilitator called Sharna Jones, who has been doing that for me. So I've been able to observe both of those processes running alongside each other and, and um, cross pollinate. And it, so I hope what I'm doing is, is holding the space, asking the right questions, being, because I know Paul so well as well, I know what he's capable of. So I can yeah. also kind of put it a little bit more pushy than I might be of other people. Um, <laughs> but ultimately, we're making something together. And my job will get less and less as we get closer and closer to the performance of it. But it comes from a shared love of the material. Um, and, and it's actually because we used to run cabaret nights together years and years ago. And we used to see each other practically every day, yeah. talk to each other. And then because life has taken us off in different directions, and because often we're not on the same bill because we often do the same job. We don't get to see each other so much. So it's actually been, I'm loving, I'm loving seeing you as much as we have been. It's been, <laughs> it's been very nice to see my friend. Aww. <laughs> oh, it's, it's very it's, soppy. Yeah. <laughs> It's very, it's very soppy thing friend. to say. We found a friend. <laughs> well, that, that's right. You know, that's the, the irony of um, uh, of the show Looking for My Friend is that uh, even though we're exploring the music and the musicality of Victoria Wood's sketches and, and songs, um, I, it has been created with a friend of 33 years, Sarah, and another friend of over 25 years, Michael Ralston, the original MD. Um, I'm not sure what will happen at, when we come out of all of this, as whether he will play or someone else will play, because uh, he was moving on to do grand other things, which he's, uh, uh, which he's uh, probably paused like everything else. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's really weird and and... And, and a complete coincidence that Looking for My Friend has been created by friends, which is yeah. nice. Oh, that's so nice. That's so nice. Uh, you mentioned there, Sarah, that you're developing your own show at the moment as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, there, there's usually about five or six things in development at the same time. So actually with Michael <laughs> Wilston, we are, we've written a musical, so we're also working remotely on, on getting that finished. Um, but I, there's a show I've wanted to make for a long time, and it's called The Silent Treatment. And it was meant to be for Edinburgh this year, but it will get pushed on to Edinburgh next year. Um, yeah. And it's about, it's about voice loss. 
And initially, it was very much about singers losing their voices because it's a, a, a subject I feel very passionately about because there's a lot of shame attached to vocal injury. And people who've heard me blither on about this will know my, my analogy, which is, you know, an athlete sprains their ankle or their wrist and we go, oh, that's a shame, that's an occupational hazard. But when a singer damages their voice, there is a, a, an assumption that they're damaged goods or they didn't do something properly. Or even someone like um, Julie Andrews, who I made a show about about six years ago, you know, was an expert at her craft. You could not fault her technique. She'd been professionally working, you know, since the age of eight. But people still were sort of, oh, well, you know, yes, you know, you must have done something wrong. So that was that was the inspiration for the piece was to explore that. And because I had my own vocal surgery about five and a half years ago, oh, wow. but then in making the piece, all these other things started unlocking. So it's it's become much more about our sense of identity connected to our voice and also uh, trauma, because my vocal injury was to do with an incident in my childhood, which we explore in the show and how the body ret retains trauma and how we find survival techniques, both on a, on a physiological level and also a psychological level. It's very cheery. It has comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it sounds really heavy. <laughs> But it, it's, been, <laughs> it's been part of an ongoing, an ongoing um, uh, development in my work to be more embodied and more physical, uh, which has sort of begun in the show I made last year about um, Kate Bush and allowing myself to be more physical in my work because I'm very much a, a wordy, thinky person. Um, and then uh, just got into a lot of um, working with this incredible uh, authentic artist collective. I know Paulus has been involved with them as well who really use uh, dance and movement as a way to kind of reconnect to our bodies, which is even more important now, I think, because a lot of us are finding ourselves very stationary. And uh, there's a wonderful book called, the, I'm looking to my right, because that's where my bookshelf is, um, called The Body Keeps the Score. And it's an incredible book, really, about uh, how, how the body remembers. The body remembers yeah. everything. Yeah, that's true. I did a dance movement psychotherapy course, uh, mm -hmm. foundation course, and uh, a lot of the reading that I had to do for that was was looking into that that thing of how um, your body stores stores trauma, as you say. Like when you're feeling stressed, you'll feel like maybe your shoulder or something like that, and then that's kind of connected to something way back when. So if somebody says something to you that hits a nerve, and it's that you might feel it there, and that's connected to that first time that you had um, that somebody be awful to you. I'm just kind of playing with it, you know what I mean? Um, and how using movement to try and get out, remove those thoughts and those feelings, just to kind of bring them to the surface so that you can then verbalize them because that's um, the most difficult thing because people find it hard to verbalize, like me right now. <laughs> what, what drew you to do the course? Um, yeah, uh, basically uh, that it was because uh, I was teaching burlesque and I feel that within that I had a lot of people coming with past trauma um, and so it was like uh, they didn't see themselves as uh, pretty or um, they had really low body confidence, self-confidence and I just sort of thought you know as a birth teacher, you need to have a little bit of responsibility for the mental health of your students as well. And as it's dance that I'm teaching, um, it kind of made sense to me to have a look down that avenue and try and understand a little bit more about movement and how it connects to emotions. So there we go. <laughs> Interesting line, isn't there? I think between when something is therapeutic and when something is artistic and uh, it, the reason why I waited such a long time to make this show is partly because I wanted to have a distance between the surgery and now. And for me, the surgery was from day to night, uh, night to day, right, really. It, it was it was so transformative. And so, you know, even though the trauma had happened, you know, 30 years before and I'd spent years and years working and trying to understand why my voice wasn't working. Once I'd had the surgery, it's just been life changing since then. But I had to do the psychological work before yeah. the physical work. And, and actually when the surgeon went in, he removed less than a millimeter of scar tissue. And it, it was such a perfect metaphor for cutting off old baggage, cutting off <laughs> scar tissue. But there is a question like, I think when you go to see a piece of theater, you wanna feel safe. You wanna feel that the artist has done their therapy, they've done their work. And I think the rehearsal room and the making room can be a therapeutic environment, but you wanna feel like what's on stage and the person on stage is safe. 
So I think that's wonderful that you've brought that into the process because I'm sure, and I know that Paulus as well as a teacher and mentor, you know, I, of course you have people, I've, I've been in tears, in I've been in tears in singing lessons, you know, <laughs> as soon as you start to get involved with embodied work, you can fall apart, but it's, it's, you have to go, you have to go through it. And it's so important okay. to create an environment where people feel that it's all right. And I've been very blessed by working with people who have been okay with me being a sobbing, a sobbing mess on the floor. <laughs> um I'm like, now where do I move from there <laughs> um I'm just gonna consult my notes for a second where would you like where would you like to move we should do some shimmying yes I want to is shimmying is, it's not like um ecstatic shaking is it is it more exercise than it's like being strapped into one of those things with a big elastic band yeah well it's just shimmying your shoulders really it's quite yeah creating a bit of movement so, oh, nice. <laughs> he's the only one not shaking right now. I feel like no, can't <laughs> hey. there's, there's not to go too down the, the therapy route, but have you come across somatic experiencing? Because that's the only that's the one I haven't explored yet, which is using sound and sound waves. No, I haven't looked into that actually, and that's something that I did. Um, I read an article a while ago about doctors. Um, uh prescribing music as a type of therapy so that's something that I would like to kind of explore mm. maybe if we can get somebody on um on the podcast who'd be willing to talk to us about those sort of things that would be quite interesting I think and a, a good lead into why the arts are important as well like now we're talking about mental health yeah. and things like that it's yeah um, I, think we can, I think we can find you someone it is. I mean, that, and this this strange period of lockdown is, you know, why do we create? Now, mostly, we I'm creating something because there's a re, there's a date. I book a venue. It forces me to make the show, and then the show happens. And yeah. so it's interesting. You know, I, I think we are creative beings, and actually, we might be being creative because we cooked dinner, or we did something in the garden, or you know, it doesn't have to be about creating content. And I've yeah. been really, you know, it. it I've got all well, the 10 shows I want to make. I could easily just go, okay, right, I'll start that project. But but we are creative and we're creative when we're children. And somehow when you don't study, if you know, there's, there's a block. We go, okay, you're not doing GCC art, right, that's it. You're not doing art anymore. And yeah. I think we need it. I think it's what make us, makes us human. Yeah, often no. when I'm not, sorry to interrupt you, Emily, often when I'm not uh, actually creating work, um, I will want to make a pie. Or, or, or just, or, or sewing. I mean, I'm really very bad at sewing, but sewing <laughs> on a patch. Uh, I sewed on a patch on uh, an old pair of jeans the other day, which I found found very therapeutic, and I also felt was, um, I don't know, just a, a bit of an outlet somehow. Ironically, of course, typical twenty uh, first century uh, person thing to do. I thought, oh no, I don't want to buy these uh, buy new jeans. I don't want to throw these away because I've just lost all of my income because I'm a creative self employed person. <laughs> So I, or I treated myself to a £1.39 uh, Snoopy patch to put on my jeans and it arrived <laughs> the next day yeah. and I was like, right, sit down, put my patch on my jeans, I'm going to sew them on myself, even though it's going to look like Frankenstein's monster, I'm going to do that. <laughs> and I opened up the box and of course, there is a handmade, given to me by the artist themselves, patch perfect size perfect for what I needed for the jeans you just I just didn't look in my cupboard and see what I already had before reaching for the online resource and uh, and clicking and buying something which was like ah god damn it <laughs> but at least I sewed on a patch you sewed it and you've got a first Snoopy patch now for another time <laughs> <laughs> That's, this might be a tangent, but it's interesting because I, like, I'm now learning to use iMovie and learning to use YouTube properly where I might have paid someone to help me do that. And so I don't want to take the money out of the hands of the people I might have employed, but I also <laughs> want to learn these things. So I don't want to be a Luddite. And, and, and actually, Paulus is giving me a half an hour tutorial next Wednesday on some YouTube <laughs> because, he's I, already, you know, yeah. I like that thing of exchanging. Um, it used to be called a let's scheme years ago, but exchanging, uh, um, you know, I might cook something for you in return for you teaching me something tech. So it's sort of exchanging skills. A let's like, scheme. Yeah, years years ago. I think it was called a let's. As in L-E-T apostrophe S. I don't know about the grammar, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> like bartering. It's, it's just right. bartering, isn't it? Really? Yeah. 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 
Yeah. yeah, the Barca scheme has seemed to have disappeared over the years. <laughs> I got very confused. I was in Australia um, years ago and they used to have a barter card. So you could pay for things by barter card. Um, so it was like uh, if you're a, a builder, you could buy pizza with a barter card. So like you'd, talk, you'd get a kind of level. So if that pizza shop needed some work doing, they went to the um, the builder to do that work for them. So, yeah. I think that's, that's a lovely good. idea. I, I think we're very, uh, with the, the sort of, there's a, we don't like talking about money. English people especially don't talk about, like talking about mm. money. And it's very hard to monetize art. And mm. this again, I mean, you know, I, I feel very, it's very lovely that people have been asking me to create online contact, content for things. And I guess I, I'm also just enjoying the quiet and the stillness. And I've given myself my own strange project of learning the ukulele. And I'm interested in the fact that I want to do that. And yeah. no one's asking me. Uh, but then also the idea of uploading something that isn't perfect, you know, and, yeah. and allowing, you know, I, my, my partner said, why don't you put a sign behind you that says, I've only been learning the ukulele for three days. And I'm like, I think I, I think I just need to put it out there and not worry about it and not worry about I thought, I thought you were going to say I think they'll know <laughs> yeah, they, will. <laughs> they really will how is the ukulele going how's the learning of the uke it's all it's all right I mean I didn't follow any rules and then I did a little um group class with the wonderful Tricity Vogue and she told and I'd realized I've been holding it in the wrong place and strumming with the wrong bit of my finger and holding it. and I was like oh it's quite good to have a little bit of technique <laughs> um, and I actually I'm halfway through a song called uh, uh stop stop hating was it stop hating hating on the uke because um three people I know extremely well had had done tweets about how much they hated ukulele and hated the fact that people were learning and I had such a strong reaction to it because I know when I first started doing cabaret about 20 years ago the uke wasn't around as much and then there was a period about 10 years ago where it was ubiquitous and and I thought why is there so much anger towards this small instrument and I did some research and for some people it's because a lot of people play it badly because you can instantly get a beautiful sound out of it but I thought why is why are people wasting aggression on being angry at a small musical instrument that never hurt anyone. What, yeah. what, is, what is that about? And, and, and how is it offending you? You know, if you are an accomplished musician, well done you. You know, some of us didn't get that opportunity. And I think what Trusadi said in this wonderful article in The Independent is, people want to join in. We want to be part of something. That's why we go to the theatre sometimes, certainly with Cabaret, and certainly yeah. with the work that Paulus and I have made. It's about the community experience. I go to the theatre to see either see myself reflected back or to explore extremes of human emotion that I either don't want to go into or I'm frightened to go into. But I want to connect. You know, I'll go to the cinema on my own, but I want to go to the theatre with people. And if I'm on my own, I'll get chatting to the people next to me, whether they want me to or not. You know, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're social creatures. We want community. So if the ukulele means you can go to a little night and join in and play your three chords, then... I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, it made me quite angry. So I've written a song, which I'm halfway through, but unfortunately I've made it incredibly difficult. <laughs> so it's gonna take me a few days to learn it. Stop hating it's on the YouTube. Time. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm gonna pick up on something you said that, because um, like theater and cabaret, because um, cabaret is like quite small and um, we don't have the fourth wall. Um, so I'm not sure if we've discussed the fourth wall on the podcast yet. Paul. I'm not sure we've unpacked it to, to a tremendous amount. I will chip in uh, just as I've been given the opportunity to, <laughs> to yeah. say to anybody that, that doesn't know what the fourth wall is, is if you looked at the stage from above, um, and let's say, for example, this is a piece of Chekhov that we're all watching, we're probably in someone's front room talking about how we wish we could get to Russia or leave Russia, you know, it's basically moaning about Russia on some level. And, uh, and we're looking through this perforated line almost between their world and our world and the wall between it is, is, is a perforated one that can be thought of as either in or out or that there isn't one, that fourth wall. Um, and pantomime, there's no fourth wall because people talk directly to the audience. And cabaret and stand-up comedy, they share, they all share that lack of fourth wall, just in case anyone's wondering. 
<laughs> Lovely to I don't think I've ever even attempted to describe it before. <laughs> I spent half my teaching career explaining what no fourth wall means because people come on entire training courses, they give me hundreds of pounds and they come on a training course called Cabaret and you will say, so everybody, you know, I assume you'll know what the, the fourth wall is because you've all come. And of course, nobody is honest enough to put their hand up and say, actually, I don't. So I don't even ask the question anymore. I basically spend quite a lot of time, not a lot, but I, I, I quite regularly explain it to a group of people because I know somebody in the room doesn't know what it means and is going to be too scared or feel stupid for for asking but there's not it's not it's not a stupid question at all but I'd rather just get past that and crack on. <laughs> <laughs> okay so yeah because what uh, you've worked in theatre and you've worked in cabaret and so I, what I kind of want to know really is like which do you prefer? Um, do you, or is there no preference? <laughs> That's such a difficult question. <laughs> For a plan, it was never a plan to do cabaret. Um, yeah. it, I mean, uh, Paulus and I had been doing gigs together, and he'd been putting on these wonderful variety notes nights since we were teenagers, and so there was definitely an enjoyment of an acknowledgement that the audience and you were were alive and together. And I I love the jeopardy. I like the immediacy of it. I I love the interaction and it's where I found my home and have been able to earn a living. But I'm passionate about theatre. And I suppose the theatre that I'm drawn to is often theatre that breaks the more conventional rules anyway. So for me, cabaret is, a, is an ingredient perhaps of a theatre piece. It's one of the reasons why I love Panto because it collects together theatre and music theatre and vaudeville and cabaret and improvisation and clowning and physical comedy. So I always think they're, they're colours in the paint box and you can choose which one you want to use. Um, and it's interesting to think what you're making and whether you're making the work because you want to see it. Are you making the work that you feel is missing? Um, and I guess, I mean, like the Globe is very, it's traditional Shakespeare, but it's absolutely cabaret. There's no fourth wall. They're talking to the audience. It's interactive. Um, and I think audiences are becoming increasingly sophisticated. So I suppose... There isn't a preference, but I think I think we're all a lot of performers, myself included, can be a bit a bit grass is greener. So, you know, if you've done you're doing one job and you're thinking, oh, wouldn't it be nice to do a film? And while you're doing the film, you're thinking, oh, I'm really missing cabaret. Um, <laughs> but I but I do think that cabaret and improvisation has sort of spoilt me, really, because you feel so present and so useful. I think performers often just want to feel useful. And I think now if I went into a theatre production where I sort of came on and did one scene in Act Two and then spent the rest of the time in the dressing room, I'd be bored out of my mind. <laughs> so I think I've sort of ended up going so far down the route of more quirky fringe production, oddball shows that it's sort of, you know, because I do do straight theatre sometimes and I've, I've been in wonderful plays at places like the Royal Exchange and and I would love to go back and work there again, but I think I'll always come home to cabaret and home to work where there's freedom to play. But I also like the discipline of crafting something with the new show I'm making. There are bits of it that are really tightly choreographed. I've had to learn to tango on my own for one section of the story and for the physicality is really tight, but then there'll be bits in it where there's the sort of flexibility of improvisation. And I'd certainly, I'm sure this is the same for Paulus with my Julie Andrews show, Michael, my 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 uh, performing and writing partner, will come up at the interval and he'll know what how I'm enjoying the show because I will have put more improvisation in, almost like rewarding them with more little bits of stuff that could go in if I'm having a good time. And if they're a bit quiet, I sort of you know they just get the show. <laughs> they get the show. <laughs> the show it's exactly. Wonderful. It, it's exactly right, you know, uh, and the uh, exploration of uh, uh, a script, a script which Sarah, for looking from a friend, which Sarah has tasked me with uh, rewriting uh, no less than 10 times now. I mean, you, you have to understand, I've never planned anything. Emily uh, is my producer on that discovery, <laughs> which I host on a regular basis, Sarah, as you know. And so she knows how very, uh, how completely and utterly unorganized and uh, unruly <laughs> I am, and that there's no plan and I, I blunder on and hopefully we get to the end of the show. And, and what I do with you is I prepare <laughs> something which we uh, are trying very hard to create something that we're very, very proud of. And you've tasked me with go away and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. And I'm really proud that I've got to the stage where I'm on draft 11 at the moment. And that is astonishingly different to 
blobbing the pie that is cabaret, the um, uh, fast food pie that is cabaret <laughs> sometimes. And I'm not trying to suggest that all cabaret acts are fast food and don't have any thought put into them. But when you're working without a script and without a fourth wall and you're responding to what audiences give you and every audience is different and you want something to be live and here and now and, re and reactive, how much here is my beautiful thing please <laughs> let's all look at it and listen to it how much can there be of that i don't i don't know i'm still finding that out i think it depends on depends on the show and the format and i like i like to think the structure is like the skeleton of it or like the step that you know the rocks across the water and you know that there is a safe path, you know that you're going towards a high point or a low point, and you've done the discipline of learning the songs. And then when you know you have that security, you can play. And of course, joyful, joyful, wonderful things happen when the electricity fails or someone's phone goes off or, and they're wonderful moments. But I, I think then you always know that you can, like a kind of a, um, sort of a climber on a rope, you know you can come back to base camp. And I think if you've done that work, then you can fly. So although we might spend hours, I remember with Russell Lucas, who's my collaborator on, on several shows, you know, I think we spent about six hours on three lines of text once because we just needed to get the mechanics of it, like the last bit of a jigsaw, right. But then other times we might completely go off piste on stage and discover something completely new. So it's that balance, I think, between discipline and freedom, which is so important. But if you don't have... If you haven't done the work, if you haven't learned the songs, if you haven't worked on your voice, your physicality, the script, if you haven't done the research, then, and it's a different thing. And improvisation, pure improvisation is a different thing. But even improvisation shows, most of them have some structure, some conceit. It's, it's an improvised murder mystery. It's an improvised. And, and I do, there are some wonderful, wonderful, especially Canadian um, performers who will come out and just improvise with nothing. But even then, they've studied story. They understand story. There is an arc. There is a journey, even if you haven't planned it. We can't, we're story making creatures, you know, we, we, you, you go out and get some shopping and come back and you have an incident and you tell it in a story. There is always a beginning, a middle and an end. Otherwise, we don't bother telling the story. No one comes out and goes, well, I went out and then I got the food and, and then I come home. <laughs> we, unless they're very boring. We don't tend to tell their stories. <laughs> Oh, I went out and there was no beans. <laughs> and then I found some beans. <laughs> and then I came home. Must write that down, that's genius. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very evangelical about story. I'm very passionate about story. <laughs> and my partner's evangelical about plot. So when we're watching things, he's always going, nothing happened in that episode. And I go, we did. We want that backstory. And there was character. And he's going, nothing happened. Nothing happened. There's no plot. <laughs> He must be furious about the Handmaid's Tale adaptation for two things. <laughs> we did the first season, and then we got a few episodes into the second one, and he went, nothing happening. So we stopped. <laughs> yeah. But just looking out of a window. It's just a woman looking out of the window. <laughs> the, the whole of the Handmaid's Tale. Uh -huh, okay, I, I won't bother then. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you like women looking out of windows, you know, they do that very well. Oh, okay. Uh, whatever, an Elizabeth thing. She looks out of windows really, really brilliantly in red okay all right I'll, maybe i'll watch it with just that <laughs> talking of stories um do you have any embarrassing tales of paulus <laughs> <laughs> this is not supposed to that's not what's supposed to be happening today i know embarrassing, I know. embarrassing for him or embarrassing <laughs> for me <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> i don't know i think we might have let one of your mum's soup catch once <laughs> <laughs> we both used to work for Paul's mum's catering company and of course because I'm not Paul's mum's child I could probably get away with a few things that Paulus couldn't I used to go around and hoover up all the half drunk champagne at the end because we're just desperate for booze really weren't we we were only 14 <laughs> 13 14 I don't think I have any embarrassing stories it's not uh, oh. I mean, I've done a lot of stupid things in my life, but I like to con I like to think of them as learning opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> we did lay down, uh, Sarah. Tell tell everybody about why we were lying on the pavement in Brixton with a bit of cardboard around our heads. Tell them about uh, that. Well, Paulus came up with this wonderful idea for a talent competition called Cheese and Crackers, and the winner would get cheese and crackers. And then every year there'd be a, a Christmas cheese and cracker off. Uh, where the, the, the runners-up prizes were baby bells on 
things. It was just a wonderful setup. But with, but the poster was done by a wonderful guy called Tim Simpson. And uh, it's our it's our faces. It's one of my favourite. I'd love to get that blown up at some point. I mean, as in not blown up, but blown up. <laughs> <laughs> Spent too much time on my own in lockdown, haven't I? Um, but it's our faces covered in crackers. But it was it was a lovely it ran for ten years, didn't it? And I think I hosted it for five. And it was one of the things that really made me think about how important it was to make artists feel welcome when they arrive because I'd done a year of stand-up I'm no stand-up comedian but I'd done a year of stand-up just to sort of learn the craft and try to learn how to link songs and it was grueling and painful but I'm glad I did it but you'd often turn up at gigs and nobody would even look at you no one would tell you the running order you'd just be expected to fend for yourself and we would always we great we give we gave people cake didn't we we give a printed yeah. running order a piece of cake mm. and have a chat and I hope I hope we made pe people feel welcome because it is a bit of a family, especially if you're all if you're all going towards the same goal. You all want a good night's entertainment, whether you win or not. And we never had a single lactose intolerant winner. <laughs> yeah, <we didn't. laughs> uh, do you know, um, I have um, I did an, uh, an interview on the radio with a previous contestant of Cheese and Crackers the other week, Freddie Valentine oh. and uh, Sam, uh, their sidekick. And uh, they said, and it's not the first time I've been told this, I've been told it many times, that um, backstage at Cheese and Crackers was tremendous fun, much more fun than doing your seven minutes on stage. And, and one of the most fun gigs that, yeah. that many people had had in their early days as a performer because of the camaraderie backstage. And that's got mm -hmm. to have been started from your saying welcome and giving them a cake and all of those things. I it's think it's because there was to... no toilet back there. <laughs> There was a camaraderie of peeing into a jug, I think. <laughs> you know you haven't explained why we were lying on the pavement in bricks. Well, we're doing the photo shoot. Piece of cardboard. Yeah, yeah I just don't think you linked it up, oh. really. <laughs> we were having a picture taken of us with crackers on by Tim Simpson. On Tim Simpson of Plunge Productions, which is an amazing, amazing company doing a little plug. He's very, right. very talented man. They're fantastic. Amazing. So looking at the time that we have left, um, this is where we kind of start our wrapping up of things. Um, what are you particularly passionate about within the arts? I mean, you've mentioned quite a few things already, but is there one that's above the rest or is there just all of the arts you're passionate about? <laughs> that's such a big question, isn't it? Yeah. There's, there's behaviours I'm, I'm passionate about, kindness generosity and collaboration and work working with people and permission to fail I think evolution I love that phrase evolve or die and I'm aware that I think I probably I think this is now my 13th show of making for myself to perform in and some of them have been absolute turkeys and um, you know failures and that's okay and I think when you're starting out your first show, your second show is so important. And, you know, I, I remember going to the Edinburgh Fringe in 2006 with the show and weeping at my two star review in The Scotsman and just thinking it, it was just the most appalling thing. And, and now with reflection, I can see what I learned from that process. So I think I think for me, I'm passionate about seeing things. I'm as, I'm as passionate about going to see art as I am about making it. And I think I think if you're someone who only is interested in what they make, it makes for a very boring performer and, a, and the joy of the Edinburgh Fringe for me is 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 50 percent making my show work and 50 percent going to see other things. I'm so excited. And I think you've got to engage with the generation below you and the generation above you. You know, we're part of we're reflecting society back at itself. So I think that that from a making perspective and just keep keep I'm, I'm fascinated to know what I'm, I don't know what I'm making next, as in there's things I want to make. I've got an idea for a, a project I'm making with a wonderful performer. Uh, about Noel Coward and Gertrude Lawrence, but we're flipping the genders. So I'm playing Noel Coward and he's playing Gertrude Lawrence, it's all sorts of things like that. Um, mm. There are things within the infrastructure that I'm passionate about. Um, I get very, I've done, I've been lucky to perform at some amazing big venues who put on signed performances and relaxed performances. And so often they are not attended. So it's mm. one thing putting them on, but you have to get the message out there. So one of the things I would, uh, and as and when our musical gets made, 
it's, 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 it's communicating that there is assigned performance in a way that will reach the deaf community because the deaf community don't hang out at deaf clubs anymore. That's, that's pre-internet. I mean, obviously they exist and they are flourishing, but you have to find ways to communicate and banging a poster up in your foyer is not going to do it. So that's yeah. something that I, I feel very passionately about, which, partly because I was at Bristol University, which is a huge um, hub for learning sign language. And a lot of my good friends were learning sign language or were deaf and using sign language. So that's a that's a sort of bugbear of mine that, you know, you, you're performing in a thousand seater venue with 20 people or nobody. You look around at the curtain call at the end for people and nobody's applauding the signer because nobody was there. So they basically signed an entire show for nobody. That's my soapbox off. <laughs> <laughs> It would be um, it would be remiss of us to not mention that we we record on the uh, the end of a week that finally saw the announcement of the cancellation of the Edinburgh Festival for 2020. And Sarah Louise, you're you you're a veteran, really. I think is what you're known as, uh, as far as uh, attending and being in shows at the festival. Um, do you want to just speak uh, a moment to first of all how how much the festival has uh, taken up your life over the years and and your feeling about the cancellation i've done 17 of them over the years i haven't gone every year i feel very strongly not to go every year you've got to go with something you're passionate about because if no one else likes it at least you like it um <laughs> i think it's absolutely it's absolutely the right thing to do uh from an ethical moral social perspective but also the to cancellation or the going to the the, the cancellation <laughs> <laughs> But also just, you know, for those of us who've already spent a lot of money on it, just to sort of be able to curb that expense now before it gets too big. I worry for Edinburgh. It's a huge, huge uh, loss to their financial uh, for the city, right? income yeah. for a city. Yeah. But but as a creative arts fair, and it's changed a lot over the years and it's got so much bigger than it was. And every year there's new complaints about it. I used to sit on yeah. the participants council and we, you know we'd get all sorts of stuff but again it has to evolve but I, I love it as a, as a festival and I will definitely be there next year I had three shows going up I had the an evening without Kate Bush the silent treatment and, and Paulus's show um but you know it's also good to take some time off from the Edinburgh Fringe and realize that other things do happen in August you know <laughs> <laughs> it is possible to go a summer without being there um, but I, I love it and I'm passionate about it and I made some wonderful friends and ended up going off to Australia to do the Adelaide Cabaret Festival as a result of it. So it's it's a beautiful festival, but it would be irresponsible of us to to keep planning and going ahead for sure. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. I think absolutely. There's funnily enough, a lot of people online, they comment on my vlog. Um, which, because I've spoken about it so much on YouTube recently, uh, because of looking for my friend, uh, planning to get there this year, and many, many people saying this is such, a, it's so strange that they've made this decision so early. That these people are what, what uh, I would suggest, without trying to be impolite, uh, as um, Joe Public, uh, not necessarily in the arts or anything to do with Edinburgh itself or uh, or COVID specialists either. But the perception from the outside world is, oh, well, that's the orchestra. That's such a long way away and I'm, you do not understand the impact that this is going to have on events and the people that invest in events. Um, I was on the phone, I mean I don't want to scare people and I don't want to leave this lovely chat on a negative thing but I will just as a warning to us all uh, to just uh, bear this in mind. I was on a call with a big producer the other day and he said do you think about the palladium pantomime for example you've invested a million pounds into it uh, as as a one of the producers i don't think that they're going to do that in december i don't think they're going to do that until there's a vaccine because you've just got to have one dancer in the chorus mm -hmm. get it you know it's not like it's going to be gone in december we won't all be sitting in our houses God hopes, <laughs> but, um, but it's not going to be gone. You know what I mean? So okay. we need to have a think about that, I think, and how we exit, because I think the exit's going to be gentle and I think change is going to be incremental as well. So what are all of us creatives going to do and how are we going to adapt for that remains to be seen. Clear up cat poo from the garden and keep learning the ukulele. <laughs> <laughs> Keep making yeah. art. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, absolutely. My husband and I had uh, dinner with uh, people from Star Wars last night. We basically put the um, dinner table in the middle of the room. We put um, Darth Vader. We had Boba Fett there. We had a picture of Princess Leia. 
So yeah, maybe that's how we get out of it. <laughs> See, that, that's the alternative. Go insane. That's the yeah. alternative. It's yeah. insanity. Yeah. Okay, we're running out of time. First of all, let's thank our tremendous guest for this episode, Sarah Louise Young, everybody. Woo! Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> and thank you, Paulus, for being there. <laughs> well, it's very difficult for a white man to say less than two women in a podcast, but I'm, <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> I managed it. <laughs> you hadn't counted on me being here. Seven minutes to answer one question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much to Keith on the decks. And don't forget that you can like us um, on uh, Spotify and leave us a review on Apple and all of our links and all the different ways that you can follow us are on Linktree. It's a marvellous thing, Linktree. Linktree front slash up your arts. That will get you to our Twitter feed and all of the places that you can learn about us and listen to our episodes. So do get involved. Okay, we are off again. Thank you very much, um, team. Very nice to see everybody in their little lockdowns. Waving now, saying goodbye. Join us again for another Up Your Arms. Oh, it's not a theme tune.